Good morning, everybody. Back at you again with another uh, message here today in this glorious day God has given us. So uh, we're going to start with a hymn from the Soul Stirring Songs and Hymn Book, number 366. In Jesus' name, we're going to sing today. Um, this song is called The Old Book in the Old Faith. Number 366, the old book. I don't know if you can see it, but the old book and the old faith. Um, let's sing in, in, in Jesus' name today. <sighs> Mid the storms of doubt and unbelief we fear Stands a book eternal that the saints hold dear Through the restless ages it remains the same Tis the book of God and the Bible is its name the old book and the old faith and the rock on which I stand. The old book and the old faith are the bulwark of the land. Through the storm and stress they stand the test. Never climb and nation bless. The old book and the old faith are the hope of every land. Oh, the grand old book and the dear old faith are the rock on which I stand. Oh, the grand old book and the dear old faith are the hope of every land. Amen. Amen. Good song there. The Bible is the book, obviously, that the song's talking about. So if you have a King James Bible, the opening reading today will be in Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. You say, which verse, Sean? Well, we're going to read the whole chapter. The whole chapter? It's a short chapter. It's got, uh, I think, um, 10 verses. So uh, Jonah chapter 3, all 10 verses. If you have a King James Bible, uh, you could read along with me. See, where's the book of Jonah? Uh, the book of Jonah is near the Old Testament. There's 12 minor prophets at the end. And Jonah is the uh, fifth book. So you have uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Jonah chapter 3, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise. Go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose, and he went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter in the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh, by decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent, and turn uh, from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he said he would do unto them. And he did it not. The word of the Lord. Greetings, friends and colleagues. It's Sean Elvis. Welcome back to part two of my little mini-series, uh, The Majesty of the Bible. Where, uh, where we're talking about the importance today of preaching, preaching the Bible. Um, in our opening reading, Jonah chapter 3, we saw that the prophet Jonah was instructed by God, not once, but twice, 
to preach to the people of Nineveh. The first time God told him to preach was back in chapter 1. Uh, it says here, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. But, you know, Jonah, he tried to get out of it, right? He he said to himself, what's the point? You know, people, they're not going to listen to my preaching. Um, and, you know, uh, the truth is a lot of the times that uh, what we can learn from Jonah here is that a lot of the times when we want to do the right thing, we know God told us what to do is the right thing. Um, we know that if we obey God and we do that, that it's not really going to uh, benefit us a lot of the time. Sometimes we... Um, we can kind of foresee things like that happening. Um, but, you know, because I'll be honest with you, most of the time uh, people uh, won't listen to your preaching, right? When you preach, uh, you end up just preaching to the choir or pe <laughs> preaching to people who want to hear your preaching, right? And and the people who should be hearing your preaching, they, they're not even listening. So, because um, that, that's how us humans are, you know, we just... A lot of times we just want to hear what we want to hear from who we want to hear it from. Um, like, you know, there's a lot of people out there who will claim that they love the Word of God, but, you know, they don't want to hear it from me. Why? Because, you know, they don't like me. Or, you know, they don't they don't feel like, Sean, you're not qualified to preach, right? You didn't, you didn't graduate uh, a Bible college or whatever. You know, they'll find some reason, right? And they'll always find a reason. But, you know, let me tell you something. Nobody... Nobody. I don't care how how many years of Bible college you had or how many years preaching experience you had. Nobody's qualified to preach God's holy word, right? Jonah wasn't qualified. You know, and, and see, the thing is, nobody preaches God's word because we're qualified. We're preached because God commands us to. Like, he, God instructed Jonah, hey, go do this. He didn't say, you're qualified. You're the only man qualified. He's saying, no, I'm choosing you to do this. Uh, I'll read from you 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Repro reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Most people just have itching ears. What does that mean? That means they're just itching for somebody to tell them what they want to hear. And not just anybody, but I, I want that guy, that particular guy over there to tell me what I want to hear, right? So, you know, because sometimes the, uh, the word of the Lord comes from people who you don't necessarily want to hear it from, right? That's how God works. He works through people who... Um, aren't anything special. You know, God likes to use people, uh, specific people who, um, almost purposely look like, uh, like they shouldn't have, they have no business doing what they're doing. Um, so let that be a lesson to us, you know, never get to the point in your life where you're not willing to hear the word of God from people. Um, especially if you've never heard from them before, right? You know, shame on you. You know, I'm not, and, you know, I'm not talking about women preachers, right? Women shouldn't be preaching, the Bible says. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of churches who won't allow men to preach in the church. Men who want to preach, you know, men who have something to say, who have the word of God to say, you know. And why do you think I'm on the Internet doing this? You know, because there's no platform in the church that I go to um, for me to preach. I mean, if, if, if you don't think I'm preaching the word of God, write it in the comment section below and let me know, hey, what did I, what did I say that isn't God's word, right? You see, you know, because for the, I preach God's word here, you know, and granted, you know, sometimes I'll give an example from my life or whatever, but it's all in the context of, of God's word, what the Bible talks about. You know, it's, it's very rare people nowadays will want to listen to the word of God just for the sake of hearing the word of God. See, I'm not somebody who believes that only one man should be preaching in the church all the time, you know, unless, of course, there's only one man who wants to preach, right? But, but you know, I believe that it's the pastor's job, the pastor's duty to train younger preachers, to train other men how to preach, you know, and, and if people want to preach, they should have the church to go there to be their platform to uh, preach, 
preach God's word. That's what the church is supposed to be for. That's what the apostle Paul was all about, right? He was training Timothy. He was training Titus. He was he was setting a good example of, of preaching. Now, speaking of which, let, let's turn to Titus real quick. Um, Titus is in the New Testament, and it's kind of a hard book to find, so if you can't find it, not a big deal, but um, I think it's after Timothy. So if you find Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy, um, Titus is right after that. And, and I just want to read, you know, first a few short verses here. In the beginning, it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And this is Titus chapter 1, uh, verse 1. According to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God, our Savior. And he goes on in chapter 2 to tell the young men, and Look, if you, if you look in chapter 2, verse 6, he says, Young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he is the contrary spirit, might be ashamed. God, God wants us to preach his word. He wants us to preach. You know, the Apostle Paul wasn't qualified to preach. It says right here, he was commanded to preach in verse 3. According to the commandment of God, our Savior. Just like Jonah, he was commanded to preach. See, God manifests himself through man, through preaching. Not through woman, not th through man. You know, when, when, when a man preaches God's word, God shows up. God shows up. And when you don't allow some men to preach, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. Or, or if you're a man who's who's afraid to preach and, and you even though you know, hey, it's my I should be preaching, you're quenching the Holy Spirit. See, he told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. It doesn't matter if, if it doesn't matter if the if it's popular, it doesn't matter um, if the people of Nineveh, Jonah are gonna listen to you or not. You need to reprove reprove them, rebuke them, exhort them with all long suffering and doctrine. See, preaching does several things, right? Preaching can reprove you. Meaning that it's going to strengthen your confidence in what you already believe. It can exhort you. It can inspire you to, to do more great works for God and to be a better Christian. It can spark a fire in you. You know that, um, or it can just flat out rebuke you, right? It can just say, hey, shame on you for your sin. You need to get it right. You're wrong. And you need to turn and, and start doing what's right. Those are uh, sometimes what we call hard preaching, right? Like rebuking somebody or rebuking some sin. It's one of the hardest messages to preach because you need a lot of doctrine and you need especially long suffering. You need to preach it with, with love in your heart, right? Now, anyway, back to Jonah. Um, the interesting thing about Jonah is he ends up obeying God the second time around and he, he actually ends up preaching, right? So he goes to Nineveh and he preaches, hey, you guys are all a bunch of sinners. God's going to judge you. Um, God's going to condemn you, going to condemn you, and he's going to destroy everything here. And, 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 and his sermon was true, right? That's what, that's exactly what God told him to preach. Um, but you know, Jonah ends up upset because J God changed his mind. God said, you know what? I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to destroy him anymore because they turned from their wicked ways in the end. See, Jonah was afraid of, of being looked at like a false prophet. Because he he told Nineveh, you're going to be destroyed. And God changed his mind, didn't destroy him. Um, so, and you know, that's what happens to us sometimes when we preach. Uh, we're afraid to say something that's wrong, right? We're, we're afraid to say something like, oh, oh no, like I, I, I misspoke or I said something wrong. You know, like here in this story, God changed his mind. So the thing is, you know, what I want to point out here is that, you know, even though you say something that's wrong, God can still use your preaching, right? So don't let that hold you back, you know, because even bad preaching, people people can um, can can learn from that, right? They can learn, just like like uh, the king of Nineveh, 
uh, learned from Jonah's preaching. He said, you know what? I, I, don't, I don't think that's right. I think God's merciful enough that if, that if we change our ways, if we get right with the Lord, I think he will have mercy on us. And, you know, so a lot of the times, you know, when, when you're hearing preaching, you have the right to say, you know what? I, I don't believe that. You know, let me go read my Bible. Let me see what it says. And, 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 and I, and, and I think if I, I think it's something totally different, you know? So th there's always good that can come out of preaching. <clears throat> but that, that's not to say that Jonah didn't preach what's true. He actually did. <clears throat> so that's not the point. But what I'm trying to say is God could even use a bad sermon uh, for good. <clears throat> now, the reason I want to start, start off with this story is because <clears throat> I'm continuing my mini-series of the importance of the Bible, the importance of God's Word and, and the majesty of it. And I want, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I want to talk about how the Bible came to be, specifically the King James Version. You can't really see it right there, but it says the King James Version. Um, <clears throat> I want to touch on why I believe that in English, uh, the King James Version is what we should be preaching out of, what we should be getting our doctrine from and learning. And <clears throat> it's not going to be an in-depth history of the Bible, but I have a lot to cover so I'm going to go quickly, um, but if you want an in-depth look at the history of how the King James Bible came to be, you're going to have to go to somebody who knows more than me. I'm just going to hit the highlights from the little bit that I know and, and try to share it with you. So disclaimer, anytime you're listening to any preaching, uh, go out there afterwards and study to show thyself approved. Don't just listen to your preacher. Go and read it for yourself, research it for yourself, fact check everything. And uh, figure out what you believe, right? Anyways, basically, <clears throat> what the Bible is, is the Bible is just a copy of a copy of a copy. Now, the Bible is 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 not the oldest manuscripts on earth that we have, um, but it's one of the oldest. One of the oldest, and, and some of the uh, early New Testament manuscripts we have date way back to uh, just a few short decades after Jesus. They were already written. That's why they're considered reliable testimonies. And, uh, and I discussed last week how some of the first Bibles that were written were uh, had to be hand copied, right? They had to be written out by hand. So it's just miraculous how um, the Bible survived that long and how precise the copies that we have from way back then are to towards each other. I mean, um, they boast a 95% accuracy, meaning for the most part, the copies that we have of uh, back then are 95% accurate with one another, right? Like if you read one copy and then you pick a totally different copy, um, it's going to be 95% of the time, it's going to be right spot on the money. And and the only differences are like maybe spelling, uh, maybe some punctuation, maybe they forgot to write a word in. And, you know, so the thing is that in itself is a miracle. But here's another thing is that, you know, of all the old copies that we have, there, there's, there's thousands of copies of the Bible, right? Like, uh, you can compare one of the oldest manuscripts on earth, um, which is Homer's The Iliad, which is considered one of the most uh, oldest manuscripts on earth. There are, all, there are less than 700 manuscripts, and even less than 200 of those are full copies of the whole thing. Compare that to the New Testament of the Bible. 25,000 copies of the New Testament of the Bible. And most of them are full copies. Full copies. Well, we have the whole New Testament. So the Old Testament of the Bible was originally copied and written in Hebrew, whereas the New Testament was uh, originally written in Greek. And that's because the writers who wrote it at the time, that's what the language they spoke. But over the course of history, in the Roman Empire, especially, you know, at the time of Jesus, the the uh, eventually what happened is the language changed from Greek to Latin. Okay, Latin became the primary language. So, the, uh, a lot of the first translations in the Bible. I mean, there was other ones, but excuse me, the main one was Latin. So, um, what happened is in the 1300s in England, in Europe, there was there was a Reformation going on at that time, right? Meaning there was uh, people protesting the Catholic Church. Um, there was a lot of complaints, uh, people saying that, you know, 
that the Catholic Church was taking advantage of people uh, because, you know, the common language of the time was English, right? But, but the church was, was preaching out of a Latin Bible because that's what they had at the time. They didn't have an English Bible. So their services were in Latin. So you would have to go down to the church and have the priest who spoke Latin translate it to you and, and tell you what it was saying in English, right? So, and people were saying, well, hey, you're, in, you're interpreting that wrong. Um, I don't think that's what it says. And, and you know, so there was, a, there was a protest. That's why they're called Protestants. Um, that was during the Reformation of the 1300s. Um, people didn't like having to go to a priest to interpret the Bible to them, right? And, and so they were claiming that the priests were lying to people, robbing people, things like that. Um, kind of like how earlier I talked about how, you know, churches nowadays um, are run by pastors who, you know, <laughs> could be preaching to you the wrong thing or not allowing men to preach in the church, th things like that. You know, maybe they want the spotlight and we're not going to get into that. It's a sermon for another day. But basically what's happening is the people start to suspect that the priests aren't preaching the right thing, Right. So that they're twisting the scriptures and things like that. And a man came, comes along by the name of John Wycliffe. John Wycliffe. And he's one of the first men to take the Latin Bible that they had and translate it into English so that the common man, the English-speaking population, could understand what the Bible says. So that they could say, hey, you know what? Uh, that's not what the Bible says, the priest said last week, right? To keep people accountable, to keep the priests who are uh, uh, corrupt to expose them, right? And and that remember, that's not to say that they were all corrupt. You know, we're just human. You know, sometimes maybe the priest just honestly made a mistake and pre preached the wrong thing. But at but at least if you had your own English Bible, you could read it for yourself and say, no, what the priest said today at church is wrong. You know, I'm reading something different when I read my Bible. Um, so that's kind of what John Wycliffe was. Uh, was doing was trying to get an English Bible for the people to read and anyway um, the problem is is uh, eventually the church got him in trouble right with the with the king and and he was arrested for heresy right he was charged he was he was uh, imprisoned and and they told him you're not allowed to uh, to translate the Bible into English all right we didn't we didn't allow you to do that so but anyway, so and anybody who was caught with a copy of his translation was was also charged and convicted. And if you were caught translating in uh, the Bible into English, you were you were going to be a criminal. And all the copies were destroyed; they were burned. And you know so that's how England was back then, right? The the church controlled the government, and you know they didn't want anybody who wasn't qualified to be translating the Bible or to be preaching, right? So. Anyway, fast forward to about 100 years. So now we're in the 1400s in England. Um, uh, John Wycliffe's dead by now, long gone. But there's a man named William Tyndale. And I don't know, maybe he came across one of the copies you know, that, that was hidden underground. And, uh, um, but anyway, he was also part of this, pro this protest movement. Um, so he began translating the Bible into English as well. Which at the time, you know... He's, was, was against the law, but he did it anyways. Um, but unlike John Wycliffe, he went back to the original Hebrew and Greek to translate his English uh, version, whereas John Wycliffe translated it from the Latin alone. But he started a brand new translation. So he didn't translate from the Latin. He went back to the Hebrew and Greek. And well, again, eventually he got busted. So the king of Eng England finds out, hey, uh, I'm busting you for this. So he arrests him, he charged him, and he eventually he sentences him to death. So his execution was, uh, he, he was actually burned at the stake. He was burned alive for uh, translating the Bible into English. And um, he became famous because uh, just before he uh, was lit on fire, or as he was lit on fire, his famous last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes that he may see, right? Now, what made this uh, period in history different from John Wycliffe is that William Tyndale had access to a printing press. For the first time in history, copies of the Bible did not have to be handwritten. So you could just print them off, ship them out really fast. So all his copies got circulated quickly. 
so fast that the king himself, even though he sentenced Tyndale to death, he ordered all the copies to be destroyed. He couldn't contain the copies. They got out there. He couldn't stop the Tyndale translation. Even by killing Tyndale and burning the copies, he only inspired people to do more work for God. He only inspired people to continue getting uh, an English Bible to the people. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I get on here and preach these messages, right? Because I want to inspire people hey, that, hey, you don't, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be have a doctor of divinity to preach God's word, to read God's word. You can do it yourself, right? Um, now, women preachers, totally different story. But that, like I said, that's a different story. Back to the Bible. Back to the Bible. There, you know, there were thousands of copies of Tyndale's uh, English translation running around um, England at this point. So the cat was out of the bag. So the king realized, okay, since I can't stop it, I might as well... Um, be the first one to get a good, my version of the Bible out there, right? And, you know, that's like, that's exactly like what people who, who are like this will do, right? If they, if they can't beat you, um, straight up in a fight, you know, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna say, hey, you know, I'm gonna stop you some other way, you know, I'll find some other way to stop you from preaching, right? So anyway, um, there came a man named Miles Coverdale, Miles Coverdale, uh, he petitioned the king, the king of England, King Henry at the time, to publish the first English Bible. And in 1535, he published the first ever English Bible with both the New and the Old Testament. It was known as the Great Bible, right? It was the first authorized English Bible translated from the original Hebrew and Greek. And it, it was a pretty good translation, but you can imagine that the work of only one man, he could only do so much, right? So what happened was, you know, people built off his work over time. They improved it. They made it better. And by 1569, a few short years later, the most famous of the old English Bibles came out called the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible, maybe you've heard of it. It's famous. It was the first mass-produced Bible. It came with uh, chapters and verses in it. And it's still today considered a very great translation. Um it was affordable. You can get your a common man can get his hands on it, and for the first time in history, you know, people had access to God's word in English. Right? It was it was a it was an amazing time, and so then eventually comes along shortly after King James. We have King James of England, right? In the early 1600s, King James. Um, and you know, it's it's not that the Geneva Bible was bad. It was it was a good Bible, but you know it. it there wasn't uniformity in the sense that, you know, the, the church was split. There was Protestants. There was Catholics. People were using different Bibles. Some people had the Geneva Bible. Some people had the Great Bible. Some people had the Latin Bible. You know, people were using different Bibles. Uh, and they started rejecting the king. But, you know, King James, he was a man of faith. And, you know, he wanted to just say, you know what? I'm going to authorize one final version, one, I want one royal great version of the Bible that everybody can use, that the Protestants can use, the Catholics can use, um, and, and, and we can just have a, a, a good English Bible we can all agree on. So what he did was he commissioned a group of men. He took the top scholars of the day, right? Like, I think there was over like almost 50 uh, different men and the top translators of his day. And these were men from Protestant churches. These were men from Catholic churches. These were men who weren't even church-going men, right? He just said, bring them all in. And, and, and I want everybody to agree. And I just want it done the right way. Translate from the original Hebrew and the original Greek into English. Let's get a solid book together. Let's, and, and, and that's what I want. One great royal translation, right? So... As perfect as possible. So they all put their doctrines aside, their beliefs aside, and, and they did it. And in 1611, they published the authorized King James Version of the Bible. Which is what we have today, called the uh, the King James Version, or the authorized version. And, um, you know, that's why it's considered today the best translation in the English. Because they literally took the original Hebrew and the original Greek and just... Put it right into English. The only updates since then have been spelling errors, uh, grammatical errors, and and you know maybe words that uh, have changed in meaning. Um, 
but basic things like that, right? So um, what I want to end with today is, and I don't want this message to be so long, but if you have a King James Bible, if you open up the first few pages, usually, normally, there's, there's this thing called uh, the Epistle Dedicatory. The Epistle Dedicatory. And what this is, is it's a is it's a letter from the translators of the Bible, all the men who translated the Bible, to King James himself. So after they after he commissioned him and they finished the Bible, they wrote him a letter and said, Hey, look, this is this is what we did, this is how we did it. And and so they wrote him a letter, and that's what the epistle dedicatory is. Um I mean, you can imagine they put all this hard work into it for the king and for God. They were proud of their work. So I'm not going to read the whole letter. It's, it's really short. It's only one page, if you can see. It's only one page. and and But I'm going to just read one sentence. I'm going to just read one sentence. I mean, there's only six paragraphs in this thing. But I'm just going to read one sentence out of it in paragraph two. And, and we're going to take a look at this and what it has to say about preaching. It says, but among all our joys, there was none that was more that more filled our hearts than the blessed continuance continuance of the preaching of God's sacred word among us, which is that inestimable treasure, which excelleth all the riches of the earth, because the fruit thereof extendeth itself not only to the time spent in in this transitory world, but directeth and to and disposeth men unto that eternal happiness which is above in heaven. So it's one long sentence in, in the second paragraph. And you see, the translators are testifying right here to the king that you know they have no greater joy to fill their hearts than to hear the continuance preaching of God's sacred word. You know, these were men who held the Bible as sacred. Right, precious. They loved it. They loved to hear it preached. You know, back then there was no TV. You know, they didn't have they didn't have smartphones. I'm recording on my phone right now, so I can't show you. But they didn't have smartphones to entertain them. They had preaching, right? And I, you know, I believe back then that the people understood a whole lot more than we do today how important preaching was. I mean, these are guys who dedicated all their time to translating to what they believed was God's sacred word. They couldn't just type into their smartphone or into Google Translate real quick and say, hey, translate this for me, right? No, they meticulously took their time. They studied language. They studied ancient Hebrew. They studied Greek. And they meticulously made sure that every single word was precise, that the meaning was the same meaning that it meant in Hebrew and English, right? So, you know, back then people understood how important it was to read God's word and and to hear God's word that you can have success in your business, in your family, in your nation. The Bible was important, you know, so they they not only needed it to be translated properly, they also needed it to be preached properly. They needed the common man to have access so he, he can read it, so he could... Uh, hold the preachers accountable, right? So that they couldn't just lie to people and preach whatever they wanted. You know, that's exactly why I make these videos, right? Like if, if anybody listens to me, you know, at, at least at least I listen to me, right? Like I just I just want to preach it. If nobody else listens to, it, I'm going to preach it for myself so I could I could preach it here in the mirror and I could listen to myself so that way I can hear the preaching because it'll make me successful, right? See, hearing God's word, hearing preaching will make you more successful. And you know that's that that that's what these guys understood that you know by hearing the word of God they said it is the inestimable treasure inestim it's hard to say inestimable that means you can't you can't put a price tag on it. It it's priceless. It's it's a treasure above all treasures. You know, it's invaluable. The word of God to them was priceless. It's the most valuable thing that you can own. You know, if you want to think about that, this book that I'm holding right here, this book is the most valuable thing in the whole world. If you get a copy of the King James Bible, you have the most valuable thing in the whole world. Now, I mean, the materials are cheap, right? I mean, these books are cheap nowadays. You you could pick one up for for a dollar at the store, right? Just because it costs 
that's what the materials take to to print it, right? But but see, the contents inside this book are God's words, and that's priceless to have a copy of what God said, right? Think about what you would give to have a copy of a loved one who passed on for you one letter of what they could tell you. That's what the Bible is. It's it's a love letter from God. He gave it to us. It's so precious. And we live in unprecedented times. You know, God's word for the first time in history is available to us for the most part. You know, I mean, there are some languages that I'm, I'm sure are out there that, that don't have a copy of the Bible in their language. But by and large, most of the world speaks English, right? Other than, you know, maybe China. I mean, the Chinese people... In fact, I think most of them speak English, right? English, Chinese, Chinese people are taught English from a young age. So, I mean, if you have English Bible alone covers most of the world right there. And then, you know, of course, there's Spanish Bibles, there's Mandarin Bibles, there's Hindi Bibles. The top languages in the world, Arabic, have translations of the Bible in their own language. So, I think the Bible boasts over 700 languages that it's translated in. So, God's word is reaching the world like never before in history. And, you know, I'm afraid that, you know, the the abundance of God's word out there is, is causing people to like maybe lose respect for it. Because, you know, if you think back in the old days, the Israelites took pride in the fact that, hey, we're the only nation that has a copy of God's word. But, you know, now everybody has one, right? Every nation has access to one. People, personal people have their own copy. Right? It's, un- it's unheard of, the times we're living in. Um, but I'm saying specifically for the King James Bible, for the English-speaking world at least, um, this book is accessible to everybody, and it's not copyrighted, for the most part. I mean, obviously, still in England, uh, the, uh, only the authority of the king can allow you to publish this book. But it, other, other than England, anybody can publish a copy of of this text of this of the King James Bible you no longer have to be a scribe you no longer have to have a license or or be a a priest or anything like that to to own the greatest treasure of all time the Bible so let's just read their last statement here in the epistle dedicatory um they said uh ver uh there's no verses in this, sorry. But they said, The fruit thereof extendeth itself not only to the time spent in this transitory world, but directeth and depositeth men unto the eternal happiness which is above in heaven. They said, The fruit thereof. The fruit of what? The fruit thereof. The fruit of preaching. They're talking about preaching. They're talking about the Bible. They're talking about reading it, meditating on it, structuring your life after it. Look, just because the King of England authorized this book doesn't make this an English book. I mean, yeah, it's written in the English language, but this is not an English book. You know, England did not create this book. God created this book. God is the author of the Bible. It's a holy book. That's why it's called, I don't know if you can see it, the Holy Bible. Bible means book. This book book, uh, did not come from English culture. It doesn't teach Catholic doctrine. It doesn't teach Protestant doctrine. In fact, the culture of this book is Hebrew, if you want to to go that route. I mean, God used the Hebrew people initially, but more important than that, this book is God's word, right? He spoke through the Hebrew people, but this is God's words, right? Translated into English so that we can understand it, us English speakers. You know, I mean... We're never fully going to understand God's word. Just like a child will never fully understand what you're telling him when you're talking to him. But if you listen enough, just like a child, when he listens to you, he understands the point. He gets it. He may not understand all of it and why you're saying it, but he he gets the main point of what you're saying. And that's what happens to us when we hear God's word, when we read it. We don't understand God. God's way greater than for us to understand, but... We can understand the point. I get what you're saying, God, you know, and there will be fruit in our lives. God's word does not produce bad fruit, only good fruit. 
You know, and, and any fruit tree doesn't start off by producing fruit. You know, it has to grow first, right? And the same thing goes with every Christian believer. You know, until we reach our next destination, which is heaven, which the tra- translators wrote about, we're just in a transitory period here until we go to heaven, right? But they said, hey, look, the key to happiness, the key to making it to heaven above is we need God's word. We need the Bible. And, and uh, so that's the majesty of the Bible. That's part two of my mini series. I'm going to end it there for today. This message is getting long. So um, I'm, uh, next time I'm going to wrap up, may, hopefully maybe wrap up the mini series with a complete overview of the Bible, uh, the Bible in a nutshell, if you will, so that we can better understand this treasure that we have today, the King James Bible. And, uh, and not just the King James Bible, but any copy of the Word of God that you have in your in your language. So anyway, that's my message for the guy. Uh, that's my message for the guys. That's my message for today, guys. Um, the Word of God is important, and the preaching of, of God's Word is important, too. It should be our joy. You know, we need to remember that it's God's words, you know, that helps us grow spiritually in this transit, uh, transitory period that we're living in before we pass on to heaven. Anyway, that's my word for the day, guys. Let's let's bow in prayer, and God bless you. Thanks for listening. <sighs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this message today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us a copy and preserving it for us in this generation. Oh, man, we're so excited to have it and read it. Um, I think uh, with the abundance of of it uh, uh, out there nowadays, unfortunately, and how inexpensive it is to own a copy, people can kind of uh, think that, you know, it's not as important as it really is. And it can sometimes go overlooked um, by what, how, how valuable of a treasure it is, Lord. So, Father, forgive us if we don't always treasure it like we should, and if we decide to spend time on our on our phone or watching TV instead of reading your word. Lord, please forgive us for that. I ask that you give the people who hear this message or who hear any preaching from anybody today or, or this week, um, give them the desire to hear more and, and to, uh, to read your word and to spend more time with you, Father. It doesn't have to be from me, but anybody. Just give the listener a sincere desire to hear your word preached. And Father, you're, you're the king. You're the king of kings. And only by your grace would you allow a sinner like me to uh, preach your word. And um, I just thank you for that, Lord, that these words came from your mouth. And please be with me as I try to preach your word as you would have it preached. Father, I thank you and I love you very much. And be with us all today. Keep us all safe. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. As always, I'm going to give God the last word. And so our uh, reading today is going to be from 1 Peter, New Testament, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 13 through uh, 25. God bless. Have a good day. Um, 1, verse 13 through 25. All right. <clears throat> Bible says, Wherefore, gird up, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without who who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions of from your fathers, but with precious but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope 
might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Amen. God bless.